it came in my own um, journal and Enterprise Limited and uh, <coughs> Irish Real Estate Investment Limited. And Mr. Richards. May it please the court, I appear with my learned friend Mr. Dinsmore for the appellant. No other party is in attendance, and I'll update the court uh, very shortly on the notice given in that respect. The appellant is Dernant, a shareholder in Polish Real Estate Investment Limited, a company established to hold in the, uh, interest in investments in Polish real estate. Now, there are two sets of issues before the court on this appeal. The first set of issues concern whether the judge below was wrong in refusing Dernant permission to continue its derivative claims against the sixth, seventh, and eighth defendants. That's Mr. De Mackay, or Mr. Cherimcha, Mr. De Mackay, and the bank. <clears throat> Our submissions on this first set of issues address his application of the prima facie uh, case test for permission to continue under Part 19, CPR Part 19. And that encompasses grounds one, two, and three of our appeal, <clears throat> namely the English law claims uh, against the bank under the SSA, the Polish law claims against the six, seven, and eight uh, um, uh, under articles 415 and 422 of the Polish Civil Code, and the Cypriot law claims against D6 and 7 uh, regarding their fiduciary duties. And the second set of issues concern whether the judge below was wrong to refuse Dernot permission to serve those claims on, on those parties out of the jurisdiction insofar as that permission was sought and was necessary. Now, your Lordship should have with you a core bundle and um, which contains at tab 9 our skeleton argument and a supplemental bundle and an authorities bundle. And further to your Lordship's <clears throat> uh, email yesterday, we've uh, also provided a bundle with the two uh, additional authorities, Cor Coroin and Steeplechase. Um, so just in terms of a route map, very briefly, um, my Lords, subject of uh, what your Lordships would find to be of most assistance, we propose to address the court as follows. First, I propose to address two preliminary matters regarding notice to the other parties and the fact that the bundles are unagreed. Um, I'll then address the relevant test on permission to continue, the prima facie case test, and we will then turn to our grounds of appeal. I will address ground one concerning Polish law claims, and in addressing that, I will set out the key facts and the relevant test on permission to continue a derivative claim. And I'll also address ground two concerning the English law claim against the bank only. And my own friend, Mr. Dinsmore, will then address your lordships on ground three, the Cypriot law fiduciary duty um, derivative claim. And then finally, he will also address your lordships on ground four, with permission to serve out. So subject to that being <coughs> uh, acceptable to your lordships, I propose to turn to the preliminary points, the two preliminary points. Uh, and the first of those is notice to the other parties. And the second, as I mentioned, was uh, an application as regards the bundles before the court, which due to the non-engagement of other parties are unagreed. First notice, <clears throat> um, as your lordships will see, none of the uh, defendants appear today, uh, and the company is the, the served defendant in that respect. Uh, there are, other, of course, other defendants uh, on the um, uh, in this matter yet to be served. The only other person present. Sorry to interrupt sorry. you, but can can you clarify? You say yet to be served, but the judge gave permission to serve some of the defendants. So has that not taken place? No, and in, in, in fact, my Lord, the claim form has had its validity extended to March 2025. Uh, and the reasons for that, my Lord, are simply um, uh, largely matters of, of efficiency in the sense of um, serving the parties uh, in one go. So the short answer to your Lordship is no one has been uh, formally served permission pursuant to his Lordship's permission. Okay. Um, the only other person presently party to the proceedings is the is the company, and it was made a respondent on the fifteenth of uh, September, twenty twenty two, pursuant to the order of Mr. Justice Mead. As to notice, uh, I'm instructed as follows, my lord, that on the twenty eighth of September, my instructing solicitors emailed all eight defendants with a copy of the order of Lady Justice Aspin, uh, granting permission to appeal, together with a listing with no notification letter. And as regards the bank, the materials were sent to its representatives, Baker and McKenzie. Baker and McKenzie responded, requesting my instructing solicitors to keep them updated, and that has been done. <coughs> uh, my instructing solicitors have sent them copies of the appeal skeleton, uh, 
and appeal questionnaires, the bundle indexes and the hearing notification letter and copies of the appeal bundles were served on the company in Cyprus on the 10th of January 2024 and an affidavit of service was provided to my instructing solicitors. My instructing solicitors also notified the company by letter on Wednesday last week that the hearing was now to be one day today instead of one and a half days starting yesterday and they provided the company with the live stream details as well. And of course in circumstances where there are, um, <clears throat> the court has indicated the live stream details, um, it may be that um, interested parties are, are, are observing that way. I, mean, I quite follow that interested parties may be observing. In terms of the company itself, <laughs> it's frozen, is it? it? It is deadlocked, my Lord, and that was a matter which the judge below was satisfied um, of, of uh, and we'll come to that in, in the course of my submissions, uh, but that is the position, yes, my Lord. Yes. The second preliminary matter, my Lord, was, uh, my Lords, was the <clears throat> application as regards the unagreed bundles. Um, this, I would hope, is, is really a, a, a technical point. It's because of the lack of engagement, there, are, of course, has not been the possibility of uh, there being agreement between the parties before the court um, as to the bundles before the court. Um, and the court, the Civil Appeals Office, on the 20th of February this year, requested by email that we file an application um, to ha to bring this to your Lordship's attention and to seek the lo your Lordship's permission to rely on those bundles for the purposes of this hearing. We have um, done that, and th that is on the file with the court. We have copies here, if that would be of assistance to your Lordship. Um, for completeness, I think we ought to take the copies, but I uh, can't see us objecting to refer to the Lord. bundle. So, and the, the, the point is simply made on the second page, which your Lordships will see. I can, I can start explaining it um, while they're being handed out, that the company, the Knights Defendant, uh, has not agreed to the core bundle and the supplemental bundle. Um, they were served on it on the 9th of October with a request that it should confirm by no later than the 15th of November as to whether it agreed and it did not respond. Um, in those circumstances, we simply seek your Lordship's permission. Uh, in, in, in the absence of any objection from either of my brethren, and I would be surprised if there were any, uh, we will grant you that permission. Uh, very grateful, my Lord. <clears throat> So, my Lord, now turning to uh, the first of, of the substantive points, which is the relevance test, uh, the prima facie case test for permission to continue. Um, what I propose to do is take your Lordship through certain paragraphs of the judgment to show how the judge approached that. Uh, and in, in short, the judge did correctly identify the test. Um, it, our um, uh, appeal is on the basis that he either misapplied it or had regard to irrelevant factors or did not have regard to relevant factors. So, my Lord, if we can turn to paragraph 71 of the judgment, and the judgment your Lordship will find at the core bundle at tab 5, <clears throat> and it starts at core bundle page 61, um, and the uh, paragraph 71 uh, starts at the bottom of page seven, core bundle 78. <clears throat> uh, and his lordship ran through how how the matter works in the present case of a foreign company. <clears throat> Given that the company is incorporated outside England, it falls outside the substantial provisions of the Companies Act, um, allowing derivative claims to be pursued by a shareholder. And we refer to Section 260, brackets 1 of the Companies Act. Um, he then noted in 72 <clears throat> the fact that the claimant was a member of a foreign company was no bar to the jurisdiction of the English court in relation to a de derivative claim. And then at 73, that the courts have taken the view that the provisions of the Companies Act um, dealing with derivative claims uh, have not ousted this ability to deal with derivative claims in relation to foreign incorporated companies, and referring there to, uh, to cases including the Nova Trust decision of uh, the Judge Pevin PC. And then at paragraph 74, it follows that the common law principles governing the circumstances in which the court will give permission for the commencement or continuation of the criminal system apply to the pre present proceedings. Nevertheless, the procedure in sections 261, 62 and 64, as the case may be, and in CPR uh, rule 19.15 is applicable. So in other words, you, you're outside 
but by virtue of uh, the rules of the CPR, the CPR then take you back in saying, um, save where uh, it's expressly not to be applied, the procedure applies. So do, I don't think this matters for our purposes, but just so I'm clear, um, <coughs> 19.7. So if, if one starts with 19.17, um, that uh, we are an other, or we're dealing with an other body's corporate. And that's a page 571. It should be, if I've got the right edition. Um, unfortunately, we probably haven't got the right, right edition. Uh, but anyway, uh, 1917. Um, this rule sets out the procedure where either a body corporate to which chapter one um, uh, of part 11 of the company that does not apply or a trade union. So where it falls in the first category <clears throat> is allegedly entitled to a remedy. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, um, uh, three, sub three, 1917 sub three, the application for permission must be made by application notice. We did that. And then four, <clears throat> the procedure for applications in relation to companies under sections 261, 262, as the case requires, of the Companies Act, applies to the permission application as if the body corporate were a company. A company, for the, that purpose, is a comp an English company. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, the judge says the procedure in sections 261, 262, and 264 yes. is applicable. And he hasn't mentioned 263. Is 263 applicable? Uh, I don't... Let me just check that point, my lord. Uh, that is in Northern Ireland. Um, I see. That's but, why. I, so believe, the, I believe that's why, my lord. Just checking that. I will be corrected and, and I can. It, um, there, there is a section which certainly applies to an ordinary English derivative claim which says. The judge mustn't grant permission in certain circumstances and is to take into account various things. Yeah. Is that one of the sections that does apply? Uh, the, uh, it does. So um, essentially, my lord, we have 260. Section 260 um, provides <clears throat> that a derivative claim may only be brought under this chapter um, uh, for, an un and for an unfair prejudice uh, claim, or a der and then subsection 3 of 260. A derivative claim may only be brought in respect of a cause of action uh, arising from an actual or proposed actual omission involving negligence or fault, um, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Section 260 doesn't apply. Sorry, that's 260. Apologies. Um, uh, uh, 261 <clears throat> um, then uh, provides that you must apply to the court for permission. <clears throat> um, and then if it, subsection two of 261, if it appears to the court that the application and the evidence filed by the applicant in support of it, do not disclose a prima facie case. And this I, I believe is what your Lordship is, is referring to, for giving permission, prima facie case for giving permission. That's it's, stage one, isn't it? it exactly, the but court must dismiss the application. That stage one <clears throat> may make any consequential order. And then subsection three of 261, which is where we come into stage two. If the application is not dismissed, the court may give directions, may um, as to the evidence to be provided by the company, may adjourn the proceedings. <clears throat> uh, on hearing the application, the court may give permission or leave to continue the claim on such terms as it thinks fit, uh, or it may refuse permission or dismiss the claim, or it may adjourn the proceedings. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, then we have 262. Um, <clears throat> That's probably the provision I had in mind, which yeah. says you must do certain things or you mustn't do certain things and you can take into account whatever. Um, and if it appears to the court, this is subsection three, that uh, the application, the evidence filed by the applicants in support do not disclose a prima facie case for giving permission, the court must dismiss the application, may make consequential order that it considers appropriate. And if it's not dismissed, again, it may give directions. So, uh, and my apologies when I referred to 263, but 263 isn't relevant anyway. And I said it was Northern Ireland. As that's simply the description of leave uh, yes, as opposed to permission. That was the reason I mentioned that. But so, so we are in 262. And 26. You, you get these different uh, um, bits of guidance, including that you 
must dismiss the application if there is a prima facie case. Yes, it's it's the and to that end, it's the same concept as would apply with an English company. It's designed to protect the company from um, <clears throat> uh, yes. claims being made in its name, which the court considers at that stage prima facie or not to be made. <clears throat> so that's that's the procedure. Um, now, as to what prima facie case needs to be shown, it's first that the company is entitled to the relief claimed, and two, or second, that the claimant is entitled to bring a derivative claim. Um, and the judge set this out, if the judgment is still open in front of your lordships, um, when looking at the decision of um, in Aboria and Sigmund, um, Mr. Justice David Richards, in the modern statement of the common law principles, um, and he cited there the decision in Prudential Assurance. Um, and we can see over the page, uh, on page 80 of the core bundle, the summary of that, um, which is that the plaintiff ought at least to be required before proceeding with his action to establish a prima facie case, one, that the company is entitled to the relief claim, and two, that the action falls within the proper boundaries of the exception to the rule in Foss and Harbottle. Just on two, that, of course, was in the context of an English um, company. As we will see, we, we more or less get there, but you stand back a bit and you say, is the claimant entitled to bring the derivative claim? In England, that is the question that is asked for that purpose. Um, but of course, here with a separate company, one needs to approach it through that route. <clears throat> um, there is then a question as to what is the proper law of the of the of the second limb, and the judge addressed that at paragraph seventy nine to eighty um, of his uh, of his of his judgment, um, and he where you have a foreign company, and he noted at paragraph eighty the decision of um, in Conam and Nayli um, of. Uh, uh, Mr. Justice Lawrence Collins, as he was, um, and identifying two possibilities that it's the Lex Fori uh, or it's the law of the place of incorporation. Um, and he said that if it had arisen for him in that case, uh, he would have held it as the law of the place of incorporation. And that was the approach that His Honour Judge Pellin QC took in Nova Trust. And the judge below um, proposed to adopt the same approach. And we don't have any disagreement uh, with that, and that's not a, a point for appeal. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll come back to the separate law approach shortly. <clears throat> uh, the judge, I should just mention, the judge also then at 82 um, and following asked himself whether even if it could, should the English court determine the question uh, as to whether um, uh, there was there, there should be permission to continue, um, and he concluded that it, he should um, because of the connections with England, um, and we again we agree with his conclusion. So, <clears throat> and, and as to the test of prima facie case, the judge has quoted in paragraph seventy seven from Mr Justice David Richards' judgment. Yes. And presumably you've got no quarrel with that. No quarrel with that. And, and I, I was going to, uh, it may be that we can move relatively swiftly through that. I was simply going to <clears throat> explain to your lordship, your lordships, what that test um, yes, constituted. See. But no, we, we agree with it. Where we, in short, um, consider that in part the judge uh, erred was um, that he... Uh, having identified the correct test, did not then properly apply that in the sense, or at least in one sense, in that he didn't take the case at first sight as the prima, prima facie uh, test requires, but um, it would appear started to consider possible arguments against uh, um, and reached his conclusion on that basis. Uh, and it's that with which we disagree. Uh, and as I say, I, I can take your lordships um, reasonably swiftly through this. Your lordship, um, 
your lordship has already identified paragraph 77 and that there's a quote from the Abariya decision that a prima facie case is a higher test than any seriously arguable case. Um, and uh, there it was taken to mean a case that in the absence of an answer by the defendant would entitle the claimant to judgment. And in considering whether the claimant has shown a prima facie case, the court will have regard to the totality of the evidence placed before it on the application. Um, <clears throat> and we can see uh, um, paragraph, uh, sorry, we can see the decision, and it may be worth turning it up, um, my lords, it's uh, in the authorities bundle at tab <clears throat> six. Um, we don't have tabs. I oh, um, apologise. Uh, so we do it's have page numbers. Page one five zero. <clears throat> and it's that's where we start. And <clears throat> the, the the analysis of the test uh, begins at fifty three, or, or rather the application of the relevant legal principles, the paragraph 53, which is page 164 of the bundle. Mm. Um, and there we see, this is the paragraph that the judge quoted uh, in part. His quote started at the second sentence, a prima facie case is a higher test. <clears throat> um, and as he rightly quoted, as the judge rightly quoted, um, it involves um, an analysis of uh, the claim in the absence of an answer by a defendant. And just it, it, understanding how it was applied by Mr Justice David Richards in that case, we can then see at the beginning of paragraph 54, <clears throat> looked at exclusively from the point of view of Triangle UK, the diversion of the opportunity of the contract with UMCOR from Triangle UK requires an answer. Uh, and then the judge went on to assess the the issue before the court then. Uh, and at paragraph 55, he then said, I'm less certain that this is the case. And I should just say here, this was a case where um, there was a dispute um, on the evidence before the court. And <clears throat> both parties were represented. Um, as I say, paragraph 55, I am less certain that this is the case in relation to the payments made by Triangle UK to Triangle Switzerland. Um, and he said that relevant funds were not dissipated. It is not at all clear what, if any, loss Triangle UK suffered. And then he says, nonetheless, uh, and this is the point I want to take your lordships to, there is before the court insufficient evidence as to the financial position of Triangle Switzerland and as to the party's agreed intentions for the future of Triangle UK and Triangle Switzerland, as discussed in the latter part of 2010, to be satisfied that the defendant has an answer to this part of the claim. So in other words, He's saying, well, I've got, I've got one story. Is there an answer? There is some evidence because it's contested, uh, but I'm not satisfied that that is an answer to this part of the claim. I'm therefore prepared to accept that viewed solely from the point of view of Triangle UK, there is a prima facie case uh, for the relief claimed. <clears throat> so that's as um, it was developed uh, in the Abariya decision. And then we could move on, and the judge referred to uh, the next case I'm going to take your lordships to, which was Buller and Buller, and he referred to that at paragraph 78 of the judgment. We don't need to look at it. He simply s cites it or refers to it. And that is at tab four. Sorry, and you, your lordships don't have tabs, but it's at page one, two, four of the authorities bundle. <clears throat> and this, your lordships will be familiar with this uh, decision of um, Justice Morgan. And uh, the relevant passages start at page 131, sorry, 131 of the bundle. <clears throat> and we see uh, a paragraph, uh, so 131, just above paragraph 20, the heading, is there a prima facie case test? <clears throat> and we see at 21, the judge there referred to the Abariah decision, which we've just looked at. And then 22, in the course of the hearing before me, counsel disagreed somewhat as to the strength of the case that had to be shown. Um, and the judge um, uh, then assessed what that test was. At 23 and 24, 
he referred to a, a, a few comments, including by Lord Reeve, as to the um, unsuitability or um, lack of uh, satisfactory aspect of the prima facie case test and his urging of legislators to perhaps use different terminology in future. But at paragraph 25, we see the judge then make his own um, comments and come to his own conclusion on it. It is one thing to ask whether the claimant has shown a prima facie case in the absence of an answer from the defendant, mm. and another thing to ask whether the claimant has still shown a prima facie case when one takes into account the suggested answer. <clears throat> if the facts relied upon by either the claimant or the defendant are not disputed, there may be little difficulty. And of course, that is our situation, subject to me and my obligation of a fair presentation to the court and explaining uh, aspects of the case that may go against us, which I, I we did before the judge below and I will do during the course of my submissions today. There is no answer before the court. Well, quite, and therefore I presume you would accept that the dilemma that Mr Justice Morgan was considering doesn't arise because, as he made clear at 22, um, uh, what he was concerned about was, well, what do you do when you've got evidence from the claimant and evidence from the defendant? And indeed, um, in that case, he not only had evidence from the defendant, he had arguments mm -hmm. yes. from the defendant as well. Um, whereas that that problem, if it is a problem, doesn't arise in our case, does it? That is right. And, and that's, as I say, why I, I there is <clears throat> perhaps limited utility in some of these cases. But where, where they do assist in my submission is they make clear that the court is required to take into account the totality of the evidence. And of course, that is defined by what is put in by, by the parties. Um, but the court is also not required to take um, as going against the claimant's case evidence which may be before the court uh, in some form or other, uh, and it is not required to assume that that may be made out. Now, the reason I mention that, your lordship is quite right to say that's not exactly what it is in our situation, but I do, and we did, before the judge below, uh, set out some points that it may be said go against us. For example, on limitation, well, which it sort of picked plainly, up. Plainly, the court shouldn't speculate as to answers that may be forthcoming when there, is, there aren't any answers yeah. given yet. But I assume you would accept that it doesn't follow that the court should take the claimant's case um, without critical scrutiny. Testing it. Uh, and testing it to the standard of a prima facie yeah. uh, standard or prima facie threshold. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and that is really where we get to, my lord. Um, uh, this was also discussed um, even more recently in the decision of Lady Justice Asplin in, Asplin in the McGoffey and University superannuation scheme. Uh, it may be that for the same reasons as your uh, Lordship, um, which as Arnold has pointed out, that, that we may not need to engage with it, but for your Lordship's reference, the relevant paragraphs, the, the decision of Lady Justice Aspen begins at 272 of the, bu the bundle, and at 307, um, we see at the bottom of the page, paragraph 137. Uh, and it's a similar discussion as we've seen in the uh, cases which we've already looked at. Um, and at 142, uh, it's the point about, Lady Justice Ackman addresses the, the point that the court has to take into account the totality of the evidence. Uh, but I, I, I don't believe um, that I, I need to take it much further than that. What, at 145, over the page, um, it's perhaps relevant in understanding what the prima facie case test means that uh, her leadership there said that even where there is evidence on both sides, so this is at page 309 of the bundle, paragraph 4, 145, even when there is evidence on both sides, it is still open to the court to hold 
that the claimant has made out a prima facie case. So simply because there might be some factor going against a claimant does not mean that a prima facie case has not been established. <clears throat> Well, as my Lord says, but not quite in that territory because there is no conflicting evidence. But that doesn't absolve us from asking whether on the materials that we've got, that you're putting forward, inferences that you suggest can be drawn, can be drawn. That's right. That's right. And um, one way of putting it is that to the extent that there may be doubt in the absence of any answer um, or even an attempt to provide an answer, that the claimant gets the benefit of the doubt. Um, uh, and that may, that's, I, I'm not trying to put a gloss on the test, but that may be one, one way that one might describe it. <clears throat> so that is all that I wanted to um, address in terms of the, the test. And, and as we discussed at the start, uh, our view is that the judge got it right in terms of what the test is. Um, now, in terms of the two limbs of the test, um, as I said, we must establish that the company is entitled to sue for the relief sword, and that is going to be the focus of our submissions today, and I'll return to that shortly. There is, as I said al already, uh, also the second limb that we must establish a prima facie case that we, the, the claimant, are entitled to bring the derivative claim under the proper law. And just, uh, I, although it's not in the order that the test is normally applied, I deal with it now to, because once I've dealt with it, I will then turn to the, the bulk of my submissions on the prima facie case question as regards the company's entitlement to the relief sword. So as we saw at paragraph 79 to 81 of the judgment, um, the judge decided to follow the approach um, in uh, Nova Trust of His Honour Judge Poe, you see, that um, he would apply the law of the place of incorporation to uh, the question of whether the claimant is entitled to bring the derivative claim. And then he addressed that entitlement at paragraphs 173 to 180 of his judgment. And your logics will find that at uh, page 107, 107 of the core bundle. Um, I don't propose to, to go through that in detail, um, but I will simply summarise his critical conclusions. At paragraph 176, he accepted the Cyprus law expert's evidence that Cyprus law recognises the concept of a derivative claim and that the position largely corresponds with that under English law. Um, and then uh, his conclusions as to the prima facie case of wrongdoing gave rise to uh, causes of action by the company. That's at paragraph 177. And then at 178, the negative control or deadlock or blocking of the company, your lordship's point earlier. Um, and at 179, he noted that the company had not responded to the present application <coughs> and so to the extent that we succeed in persuading your lordships that there is a prima facie case of wrongdoing as against the sixth seventh and eighth defendants in our submission that would then also satisfy and there is therefore a prima facie case of entitlement to bring the derivative claims just as the judge held as regards the first to fifth defendants we would say so to for the sixth to eighth. <clears throat> the yes. judge also held relevantly. Um, Can I just, just tease out that submission just for a moment? As I understand it, what you're submitting is that although technically the judge has only decided that point as against the first to fifth defendants because they were the only ones that were in the frame by that stage of his analysis, your submission is that by parity of reasoning, the same conclusion would apply as against the other defendants who you're seeking to bring in by this appeal. And your lordship is absolutely right to, to explore that and, and, and tease that out, uh, as you say, because it is um, correctly a, a step, a separate step 
that a court does need to go through. So taking a step back, as against each of defendants six, seven and eight, number one, is the company entitled to the relief that it seeks against them? That's the prima facie case test under Polish law, Article 415 claims, English law under the SSA, fiduciary duty claims. And those, that's where I will spend the bulk of my time and Mr. Dinsmore will also address your lordships. We say um, that below, the judge rightly held um, that he was satisfied as against the first to fifth defendants on that first limb. And applying that logic, he then, and on the basis of the points that I've just run your logic through at 173 to 180 of his judgment, he then concluded on the basis of those findings, additionally on the basis of the deadlock within the company, and additionally on the basis of the Cypriot law analysis of that situation and whether an entitlement to bring a derivative claim arises as a result, he then was satisfied that the second limb of the derivative claim test, namely the entitlement of the claimant to bring the claim, was satisfied. Now, the, the only bit of that puzzle that remains for us today, we would submit, is that first part, namely whether the company is entitled to uh, the relief it seeks. Because the other aspects, the Cypriot law position, that remains the same. The judge has already um, held in our favour on that as regards the first to fifth defendants but we say that is equally applicable. There's no reason for this court to depart from his findings in that respect. As to deadlock, exactly the same. No reason for him to, <clears throat> um, for this court to, di to diverge from the judge's position. If it's deadlocked in one respect, uh, we would submit there is no suggestion or no reason to think that it is not deadlocked in any other respect. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, the absence of any response from the company equally applies to the claims against the present, um, against the, the, the relevant parties for the present. And, and one might say, as regards paragraph 179, the judge there was referring to the company failing to respond to the application that came before him. Of course, we are now in a situation where the company has yet further failed to respond to the appeal that is before your lordships, which we would say, again, is, is relevant. Uh, does that um, assist your lordship on that question? Thank you. <clears throat> I was just going to quickly pick up on the, the final points on, on this uh, in terms of the, the test that his lordship, um, the judge below, addressed when he, in the section he entitles Other Matters. And this was simply the points which, again, the same, um, applying the same logic, we would say also apply here, as to whether an independent board would, could reach the conclusion that it was appropriate to bring the relevant claims. Um, and if one looks at 183, his first sentence there, in my view, an independent board of the company could reach the conclusion that it was appropriate to bring the claims identified where I have concluded there is a prima facie case. So again, it's, a, it's continuing the logic to the extent that your lordships consider that there is in fact a prima facie case as against any of the sixth, seventh or eighth defendants. To the same extent, we would contend that the uh, judge's reasoning would apply in the sense that the, the company's board could reach the conclusion it was appropriate to bring the claims against them. <clears throat> and his final paragraph... Uh, well, I was to ask you a question about that, because by this stage in the analysis, the judge has concluded that as against the first to fifth defendants, both limbs of the test are satisfied. Yeah. So one might ask the question, what is the relevance of what he considers under the heading of other matters? Now, 
I don't think the judge says this quite in terms, but would you accept that what he's doing here is exercising a discretion as to whether this is an appropriate case in which to grant permission to bring a derivative action? Is, is that what he's doing? He's looking to see if there are, as it were, any other discretionary considerations that we ought to take into account? Um, it's not entirely clear from the judgment. And the um, reason why I, I put it that way is because of the way he, he, he articulates it in the paragraph to which you drew attention, 183, um, appropriate to bring the claims identified, where I've concluded there is a prima facie case. Yes, uh, I, I see. I see your lordship's point. I'm just. Um, he's, he's working through section two six two. It's exactly um, right. I was actually just trying to turn up the Morgan but, decision as well. But that that doesn't entirely resolve the question because section two six two or section two six one says the court may permit a claim to continue, which sounds discretionary. <clears throat> yes, although it's a negative in the sense that there is a claim and the requirement is for the court must not permit it um, as opposed to simply letting it continue. So it, is it quite like that? If you go back to 261, which you were reading out a moment ago, does that not say the court may permit the claim to continue? And then 262 says, well, when you're deciding what to do about the claim, there are all these particular rules, including the rule that you mustn't allow it to go ahead yeah. if there isn't a prima facie case. But in that context, there is reference to what an independent board might think. Yes, um, I, I do see where, where your lordship is going with, with that. Uh, I mean, where we get to is is this, that if it is part of the judge's, um, if it's wrapped up with his conclusions on the prima facie case test, and it's not not an exercise of a discretion, then your lordships are perfectly able to uh, grapple with the same point for the in the same way that the your lordships will do on the prima facie case test and the submissions that I'll be making on that. <clears throat> if it is forming some kind of exercise of discretion, um, and just on that point, it's worth noting that the judge doesn't appear to, he doesn't give the impression that if he had decided against us on these, that that would necessarily have been fatal. It's simply a further reason to uh, agree with the continuation of the permission, uh, uh, continuation of the claim. But, but if it was a discretionary, uh, an exercise uh, of discretion, the way that uh, in my submission this court can deal with it is by taking a step back and saying, well, what were the underpinnings which led to the, the judge arriving at that discretionary decision? Well, so I just ask you about uh, that? Because as I think you've anticipated, the reason for these questions, both for myself and my lord, is it's relevant to the role of the appellate court. So where you've fallen down on your application as against defendant 6 to 8 is on what one might call the negative aspect of the test, which is the court must not allow the derivative claim to proceed if there's not a prima facie case. And as to that, I assume that you would accept that's not a question of discretion, but it is a question of evaluation. Yeah. Right. Then one gets on to what, one might, what we were calling the positive aspect of it, which is assuming that progress of the claim is not blocked because of an absence of a prima facie case. On the contrary, there is a prima facie case. The court still has... A discretion to exercise and that seems to be what the judge is considering here but at least as against the first and fifth defendants to the extent that he's exercising his discretion it's in your favor yes um and it may be that um 183 the first sentence is is a, a, an important sentence in the sense that the judge <coughs> 
uh, has made clear that um, in his analysis, um, or, or at least the judge may be saying there, that um, the courts, the, the English courts analysis of whether to, uh, how to uh, apply that positive aspect, as your Lordship describes it, um, is essentially one that's, that sits squarely uh, or, or, or is um, entirely addressed by the prima facie case uh, question. Um, now, he does go on to some other points, but just on that. So if it's right <coughs> that... Um, that there is, well, put it this way, he is treating it, uh, in my submission, as a prima facie case test, in the sense that he is saying, uh, if it is a prima facie case, if a prima facie case is made out, then an independent board could make a decision to proceed with this claim. Okay. Uh, I mean, in terms of what we're doing, uh, as you say, we've got to consider the prima facie case aspect. Um, suppose we were with you on prima facie case, uh, which obviously remains to be argued, but assume for the moment we're with you on prima facie case. The question then is, does it automatically follow that we grant permission, uh, or is it rather the case that there is then an a discretion to be exercised uh, a discretion which potentially we could exercise or mm. one which we could send back to the judge. So, and I, I, I was sort of attempting to get there, mm. but um, uh, the, first, the first approach, it seems to me, is that this court is entitled to say that the judge squarely placed his decision on <clears throat> um, discretion at large, exercise of discretion at large in this context, on the prima facie case test. In other words, he was saying, if uh, if there is a prima facie case, then there is a discretion to for this court to permit that claim to continue, and uh, and specifically, and an independent board could make that decision. So therefore, if this court concludes that there is a prima facie case, then this court can be satisfied that the judge below has already decided that the court, that it would be appropriate for the court to permit uh, a claim to continue because the court, the, the uh, independent board could um, uh, reach the conclusion as appropriate to bring the relevant claim. In other words, it just, it, it, it naturally follows. So it's, it's, it's looking at the judge's discretionary decision and saying, well, what actually is he deciding? Um, he is deciding on this analysis simply that in circumstances where there is a prima facie case, then in the exercise of discretion, the court can conclude that an independent board could make the decision. So that's the, perhaps the simplest route. But he's, on, <clears throat> he's only making that decision here in relation to the claims that he thought there, were, there was a prima facie case in respect of that, well, that's, <clears throat> so that is the question. Theoretically, if you had a, a, a prime facie case against five mm -hmm. defendants uh, and uh, a prime facie case against five other defendants, you might say, well, an independent board would approve uh, claims against these one to five, but not against these six to ten, because they don't have any money, or something very simple like that. Um, and that's the sort of test that he's applying here in 183, is it? Well, so, so, and this is the going to be the division between my first route and second route. On the first route, um, in my submission, what is in fact happening is the judge is saying, I have a discretion. How should I exercise that discretion? This is how I'm going to exercise it, or this is how I consider it appropriate to exercise it. If I have concluded that there is a prima facie case, then there is a discretion, <laughs> and without reference to any any party, um, if there is a, if I have concluded that there is a prima facie case, then it is reasonable to conclude that an independent board could decide that it is appropriate to continue the claim. 
And if he's made that decision, if that is this court's analysis of what the judge has done, then this court is entitled to say, we have decided that there is a prima facie case. The judge below had already considered that it would be appropriate in circumstances where there is a prima facie case to conclude that an independent board could decide that it's appropriate to continue a claim. Mm. Therefore, that, that box is ticked or that, that discretion um, is satisfied. So that's not inconsistent mm. with what the judge has done below. In fact, it works with his, with his judgment. Can I just ask that, about what, what, where this, <coughs> this particular paragraph fits within the legal analysis? Because <coughs> having looked up Iazini and the passage concerned uh, that's quoted there, this is all about section 263, subsection 2A, which is not one of the three sections that are referred yeah. to in CPR 19.7. But what it says is that um, this is about whether permission should be given. And it says that permission uh, must be refused if the court is satisfied that a person acting in accordance with section 172 dot, 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 would not seek to continue the claim. So that's a mandatory bar. And that seems to be the exercise that the judge is engaging in. Um, I'm not criticising him for it, but I don't, at, at the moment, I don't quite understand why he's doing it. Well, it the criticism may need to be directed <laughs> at me, my lord, for, for, having, for having raised these points before the judge below right. in, in the mm. first place. So uh, um, your lordship is absolutely right that um, it may be that those points do not, in fact, arise, um, and that is therefore a swift cut through. One could consider that given that the derivative claim test is there to protect the company, that there is, regardless of whether it's under the common law or under 263, some consideration on the part of the court as, what it, as to what it's appropriate, uh, what a company could do. I, this is complete sideshow, but at the moment I'm confused on the numbering. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as you, you were explaining a moment ago that um, uh, section 261 mm -hmm. tells you about the first stage and second stage process, and section 262 is the one that tells you you mustn't allow it to go forward if there isn't a private case and so on. Now, in terms of what my Lord was saying, the numbering sounds different. It sounds to me as though uh, what you've take it to be section 262 would look like section 263. Um, I think, I, I, um, <clears throat> Lord Justice Morby, I believe, was referring to 263... Three subsection 2A. A, that a person acting in accordance with... Section 172. Section 172, duty to promote the success of the company, which, of course, is the English Companies Act um, provision would not seek to continue a claim. Yes. As I understand it from the CPR, that section is not a section that is um, uh, one that the um, uh, rules, the, the civil procedure rules, require one to, um, <clears throat> to, to apply. And so we are... We are in my mind, the judge having yes. taken, signposted the route that he was going down yes. right at the start, then seems to depart from it. Yes. Section. Uh, and, uh, or, or, or if not depart from it, at least add some add some extra point. But to your Lordship's point, it, it, um, it, it is right that it's section 262, where we, which is where we were. Yes. I I will look this up at uh, lunchtime. To, and I will do the same. So, uh, 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 how does section 263 begin? The following provisions have effect where a member of a company applies for permission uh, under section 261 or 262. And it, but what does we, that mean it does apply? <laughs> well, what we will look at is why, why is it that um, 263 is not listed in um, the CPR? In, the, in, in 19.17.4. Um, my learned junior will be getting on with that right now, hopefully. Um, but I was on the first aspect of the discretion, um, and I would suggest that does provide a route through for this court. Uh, <clears throat> the, the alternative is that this court um, would be entitled 
to the extent it's applicable, or just Warby's um, point, um, to conclude on the basis that um, there is a prima facie case that um, in any event that would, uh, a, a, a independent board could then conclude that it would be appropriate. Can I summarise where I think we've got to, yeah. which is I think you have accepted, but tell me if I'm wrong, that regardless of the inapplicability of section 263, Nevertheless, the court does have a discretion to exercise, even if there is a prima facie case. But you say, first of all, the judge has exercised that discretion in your favour, as against D1 to D5, and by parity of reasoning you say the same applies, as against D6 to D8. And in the alternative, you would submit that if we are satisfied that there is a prima facie case against those defendants, then we should exercise our discretion as well. Yes, and then there may be a third limb, which is that it goes back to, to the judge below on that very limited point. Uh, and then just before you move on to the substance of what you say about prima facie case, we've talked about discretionary decisions and evaluative decisions. And I think you accepted that the decision on prima facie case was evaluative. Have I understood you correctly? And so, my lord, what was your alternative? Was there an alternative? Uh, I'm not at the moment putting forward an alternative. Is is it right that you accept that the decision on prima facie case was an evaluative one for the judge? Uh, yes, it's it, it, he's not. He's certainly not exercising a discretion in, in that sense. He's he's um, considering the totality of the evidence before him. I mean, what why when it matters that, is that this court is the slower to interfere with evaluative decisions. Yeah, it, 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 do, do you say we're in that category or not? So what, what he's doing is he's looking at the totality of the evidence. He is um, considering whether a test is met. And um, in our submission, that's, that's not an um, evaluation of the evidence in the sense of working out what's, what's right and wrong. He is uh, looking at the evidence and asking himself, simply, by application of the test, whether there is a prima facie case. Now, in, in my submission, that's, that's not an uh, evaluation of the evidence um, in the sense that a, a first instance judge would conduct at the conclusion of a trial, for example, where the judge has heard submissions on the evidence, uh, the oral evidence, and comes to a conclusion on that evidence. It's not that exercise. At this stage, the, the, the judge is simply conducting a, a I mean, superficial is the wrong word, but it's a, a, an oversight um, consideration of the, the claim and asking himself the question in the Companies Act um, whether, <clears throat> whether um, there is a prima facie case. And, uh, I mean, th th this point may conceivably be a significance. Uh, you say we don't approach this on the basis that the judge has made an evaluative assessment with which the court should be slower to interfere. If it were the, an evaluative assessment, then you would be into, is it sprint from type authority, uh, where this court is slower to interfere with the judge's decision. Uh, and we better be clear at some point yes. about whether we are in that territory. We're not in the same, and, and the reason I say that quite firmly is one looks at our grounds of appeal, which make clear that the, the, the criticism, well, the, the relevant aspect of the judge's decision-making, which is before this court, is what he looked at and what he didn't look at and how he applied the test. Well, that might be consistent with what I think is a sprint from type approach, you say he failed to take into account the right things or took into account the wrong things. So that's not quite the same as just saying he was wrong. But but where he was wrong, and so this is the, this is the I mean, it, we, we will come to it, but <clears throat> he's wrong in his application of the test because what he does is starts to posit in our submission potential arguments against uh, either expressly or uh, he must have done this, potential arguments against our case. <clears throat> and that was a misapplication of the prima facie case test. And your lordships will see that that appears um, uh, in all of our first three grounds of, of appeal. 
There is then the aspect of the, the consideration of <clears throat> Mr. Moskva's evidence and how he uh, uh, considered that. Again, he was wrong when he said... Yes, but these are all arguments as to why you say the judge is wrong, but they're not arguments about what the nature of the test is. And I think what your submission is, is it's not an evaluation, you say, because there's only one right answer. Yeah. Whereas what characterises an evaluative assessment mm. is there's the potential for more than one right answer. Absolutely. And even more so when you get to exercises of discretion. Your Lordship's put it better than I could. <clears throat> so, my Lords, that, that concludes the discussion on the, the test. I was now going to move on to, to ground one. Um, so, uh, a, a very short point at the outset, my lords. Um, our, on ground one, if we could turn up our skeleton, which is in the core bundle at um, the tab nine, page 200 of the core <laughs> bundle. Page 200 is paragraph 29. <laughs> We see here the um, paragraph 29, the ground 1A is the first aspect of the, the criticism of the judge. Um, he erred in law in that he misapplied the prima facie case test and or failed to take into account certain relevant evidence as to the involvement of the bank, Mr. Cheremcha and Mr. Lukai, <clears throat> in the wrongdoing and or the relevant evidence of the claimant's Polish law uh, expert. Um, and if I could just, uh, apologies, I'm just trying to find the. Uh, and then at 1b, at paragraph 30 of our skeleton, which is at page 203, we see um, the second limb of the ground, which is that further alternatively, the judge erred in fact in that he mistakenly considered that the claimant's Polish law expert had not addressed certain matters relevant to the factual determinations when he had, <clears throat> and or in that he concluded that the bank, Mr. Tremsure and Mr. Nakai had no involvement in the key events that caused loss to the company. I just want to emphasize the and or there, and the reason I, I do so is because if your lordships then turn back to our grounds of appeal, um, there is, it would appear, a typo. Um, which I ought to um, draw your logic's attention to. Um, at page, core bundle page 18, 1 8, there is a missing and or. So at the top of page 18, B, that's the point I've just uh, referred your logic to. And without the and or, there's a, there's a potential for it to be read the wrong way. So the judge was wrong, in fact, in that he mistakenly considered that the claimant's Polish law expert had not addressed certain matters relevant to the factual determinations when he had, in fact, and th that's where the missing is, um, and or, because otherwise it re may read, he had, in fact, concluded that Mr. the bank, Mr. Tremsher, Mr. Kai, had no involvement. And, of course, the, the expert had not concluded that. So... Um, we're in your hands, my lord. In our submission, it is clear what's intended, but if there is a need to correct that, then we would apply, and we do apply to do so. I, my feeling is that we can read this in the way that was intended. I'm, I'm grateful, my lord. <clears throat> so, a summary of ground one. Um, as we've seen, um, our position is, uh, as I've just set out on ground 1A, ground 1B, and we therefore need to look at the relevant fact evidence that he should have taken into account and the relevant expert evidence he should have taken into account and that which he shouldn't. Um, I'm going to focus my submissions for these purposes on two key aspects of the wrongdoing. The first is the subrogation claim and the steps that were taken in reliance on that, including the MJWK default judgment, 
and the bailiff sales of the certificates pursuant to that. And then second, the 2014 SPA and the 2018 Annex, and the claim brought by PSPT and its default judgment pursuant to uh, those agreements, and the third bailiff sale of certificates pursuant to that. And I mean, it, just cutting to the chase for a moment. Fundamentally, you say your loss occurred because the certificates either were sold as undervalues or the proceeds were misappropriated. The certificates were sold as undervalued, and that included new certificates issued without our knowledge. Um, or they were misappropriated, but the critical point there is entirely in the, in the sense that so long as there were sales uh, or transfers of control of certificates within the company, within the, the group structure, there is an argument that some, at least some degree of control may have remained because say MJWK held all of the certificates, it, so long as PRI still held one certificate, um, it was a subsidiary and under the control and ownership uh, of PRI and PRI still held the, the total value. Um, now we, we, in fact, our case is that as these certificates were taken away from PRI, it, it lost more and more control and it, or it became more and more indirect and therefore weaker. But on any view, um, when the final certificate is removed from PRI or sold, that's that's it because at, from that stage onwards, Pre has no control at all and no ownership of any of the companies within the subsidiary group. Um, now, as it turns out, uh, and the judge identified this, the bulk of the sales of the certificates does appear to have gone to MJWK, which was within the group structure. But there were certainly, and particularly with the third bail of sale, it would appear sales of certificates outside the group structure. Now, there is a question as to whether um, some of the originally outside purchasers, which are all, at all times controlled by either Michael or Vladek Yorosovich anyway, even though they're outside the group structure, structure uh, at some point it appears at least one of them may have been brought within the group structure. But again, that doesn't matter um, from the time at which the final certificate is lost by PRI, because then essentially the group is a separate group. It's not PRI's group any longer. So it's a long way of answering your Lordship's question. Uh, there uh, are I mean, today, putting it very all broadly, it's the what happened to the certificates that you see gives rise to the loss. There is the additional question of the uh, um, potential expropriation of assets in the form of sale. And there is a question mark over that because we simply don't have all of the evidence to indicate to us what happened to the proceeds from the Bialystok uh, shopping centre sale. And, and on that, th there's a couple of points that arise. It, it appears that some of those funds were used to pay off debts of subsidiaries and so on. And the loss in that respect is at the moment not possible to quantify, but one can envisage a loss in the sense that PRI may have decided to do something else more remunerative with the proceeds of that sale, but it never was given that opportunity because it didn't know about, about that sale or is un it's unable to identify where those funds went. So there's a, there is a potential additional loss there. Now, can I focus on the defendants with whom we're concerned? Is there any allegation or can it plausibly be said that either the bank or the nominee directors had any responsibility for any misappropriation of proceeds of uh, the shopping mall? It's, it's potentially, potentially relevant. And I say that for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> um, one, the, the Bialystok, uh, shopping centre was originally to be sold under the 2014 SPA. It was the the sale condition precedent, if one puts it that way. 
your Lordships may have noted, noted that in the 2018 annex to the SPA, I'll go through this all in detail, the, the shopping centre has changed to a different shopping centre. Um, I won't be able to pronounce it, but it begins with a, a G-R. Um, and, um, but the, the Alastock shopping centre is nevertheless sold. So first, the bank and its directors have involvement in the proffering of that as a, uh, a source of funds for the exit of the bank. That's just, just a po and pausing there. Why would that give rise to any breach of duty on anybody's part, so far as the bank and the nominee directors are concerned? Well, I'll come to that in detail, but but it's the it's the failure to um, under the SS, well, under Polish law, it's assisting, assuming that that those funds were used in a way that they should not have been used. It was assisting the wrongdoers in that, and and importantly, not informing the other shareholders and the company. Of what was going on. Now, can we just? But I appreciate that, and your lordship should be alive to the fact that this is certainly lower down our our list of wrongdoing, if that makes sense. It's not. It's not our the point that we put at the forefront in terms of the the funds from any sale of a shopping centre. Well, can I just break it down? That so far as the whatever it is, the one beginning with B shopping yeah, centre is concerned, stop, yeah. it was sold. Uh, and something must have happened to the proceeds. Um, taking it by stages, is there any basis for an allegation against the bank or the nominee directors that they acted wrongly in relation to the decision to sell the shopping centre? I, I believe that the answer to that is no. But subject to one caveat, the any <clears throat> surrounding terms or conditions that may have attached to that. So by the time it was sold, I believe this, this is correct, it was known to the company that it, that, that shopping centre was going to be sold. But what is not known is what, as I say, what's happened to those funds. OK, let's take that second stage. Um, so... You say, well, there's some reason to believe the proceeds of the shopping centre may have been misappropriated. What is the basis? Is, is there any basis at all for tying the bank or the nominee directors to any such misappropriation? Um, at the moment, I would have to say our, our evidence on that is limited, in the, not least because we just don't know what's happened. And I, I so, quite follow generally that there are all sorts of things you just don't know. Yeah. But... That doesn't mean there's a prima facie case. No. Is it right that so far as the sale of the shopping centre is concerned and whatever happened to its proceeds, there is no prima facie case of wrongdoing on the part of the bank or the nominee directors? We are not, and we didn't um, <clears throat> before the judge, run a case that the prima, the prima facie case arises on those facts. So we can leave that out of it. And as you'll see in my submissions, my Lord, that's, that's not a, a focus. It's incidental, essentially, for the purposes of today. So the relevant loss we're concerned with is uh, loss arising from what happened to the certificates. It's, yes, what happened with the certificates and control within the company, which is part and parcel of that. So there's loss of the certificates from PRI itself and loss of certificates from the group. Uh, and of course, dilution of the certificates. Um. <clears throat> yes. So, and just to, if, if this assists. <coughs> Sorry, just, just before we do, is there any case in relation to the dilution of the certificates? As, so against, as against DC. As against the bank and the nominee directors. So the decisions to issue new certificates were taken without um, the company's knowledge. <clears throat> and at the moment, we do not know what involvement the bank or the directors had 
in the decisions to issue those new certificates. So again, no prima facie case in that respect at the moment? Not at the moment. I, mean, I, I would caveat it with this, my Lord, and I appreciate that this is in general terms, but it is, it is important. <coughs> All of those acts took place within a course of wrongful conduct. <coughs> and the lack of knowledge on the part of the company and the, the wronged shareholders, if one puts it that way, um, was in general terms. So there were specific instances or specific events which the company did not know of. But more generally, the company was simply unaware of what was going on. When you, when you say the company, you mean your nominee directors? I mean my nominee directors, but in, in, on some occasions there weren't even any attempts to formally notify the company in a letter or an email address to the company. These, are, these events just took place. Now, <clears throat> that's important because uh, that was in a, a world where um, the, there was a, a lack of uh, information coming, where there were attempts on the part of, uh, for example, the Durnant directors, but also the Sazia director, Mr. Jan Yorosevich, sometimes abbreviated as JJ, <clears throat> to find out what was going on. And at the very least, there was a lack of <clears throat> cooperation on the part of the bank and its directors, its appointed directors, to assist that. So, so when I answered your lordship saying, I cannot point to a specific wrong on the part of the bank, or at least a prima facie standard, on the part of the bank or its appointed directors as regards the issuance of new certificates, it is important to caveat that with a, because of the lack of information and the positive part being played by the bank and its directors in that lack of um, information, including obstructing or abstaining on votes uh, uh, for investigations, and we'll see that uh, when I come to it, there is a point of fault on the part of the bank and its appointed directors in that respect. Well, Put it the other way can, around. Can, can I be clear? Is there a pleaded allegation of fault in this respect against either the bank or the nominee directors? If so, can we see it, please? Yes. Um, so the, the answer is, uh, and your Lordship may well anticipate this, it's in, in ge more general terms. So, for example, if we get to... I'm just going to find it, my Lord. Um, uh, page once, core bundle page 168 uh, through to 170 sets out um, at the bottom, as so this is paragraph 67b, as for Mr. Cherencha and Mr. De Mackay, so they had knowledge of the SPA um, and just pausing there, as we will see, the SBA and its annex lead on, they, they involve PSPT in this whole process. And it's PSPT, which on the back of the 2018 annex, brings its default judgment claim against the company. And it's on the back of that, that the bailiff sales take place. Now the question for, specific to your Lordship's question about issuance of new certificates is, were those new certificates issued in order to assist the, the third bail of sale? I can't answer that. And, I, and so... That's not something pleaded, so we don't have to worry about it. Not today. Um, then, at Roman numeral two... Sorry, uh, at one, knowledge of the SPA... Yes. Um, well, obviously, knowledge isn't a breach of duty. No. Uh, involved in concealing it. Yes, and that's one of my general points about as a party to the SPA, 
not in accordance. Well, this is the directors, not the bank. So the allegation is is it's that the directors were involved in concealing it. Yes. Um, they one of them was a signatory to the original SBA. So they knew about it. Yes. But you that itself can't be a breach. It has to be that they were involved in concealing it. Yes. In circumstances, presumably, where they believed that the company ought to be told about it. Otherwise, there wouldn't seem to be a breach of duty. Believe or ought to have believed, ought to have considered. Well, that won't do for fiduciary duty, no. though, because... It needs to be a deliberate or, or a You have knowing. to think that you ought to be telling somebody. Yes. And it's that alleged, that they thought that they ought to tell the company, but didn't. Um, my Lord, uh, it, Yes. So if one, if your lordship looks at the second sentence, they were aware that it involved, or at least suspected, involved a breach of the SSA. And in those circumstances, um, I would submit that it's, it's a, a, a logical step that in those circumstances they knew that they should have informed the company. So just jumping around, in terms of fiduciary duty, I see it's paragraph 76. 76. <clears throat> um, where we get yes. very general allegations of breach of duty without any specificity. Yes. And no allegation that they thought that they ought to be telling the company or the other directors about anything. Not expressly pleaded, my lord. So let's just come back again to 67B1. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, taking it by stages, you're going to explain to us why there was a breach of the SPA. Yes. Or, or, bre or, failure, or a breach of the articles. Yes. Um, and supposing are... that's a doubtful question at best, can you infer anything about what they thought? Um, you can from their failure to... from their failure to send on or copy in uh, others to their communications with the wrongdoers. Uh, there would be no reason to do that were it not for a desire to keep things hidden. In addition, we can see from some of the correspondence, which I will come to, um, a knowledge on the part of the bank uh, through its directors that there were, that the, the pre was unaware of steps that were being taken by the wrongdoers. I'm going to shut up and let you take your course to know. But let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that Alan and Overy did their job properly and drafted the SPA on a basis that didn't involve a breach of the articles. Um, or let's suppose that the nominee directors thought that was the case. They thought that Alan and Overy would have done their job and there would have been no breach of the articles. Then you can't infer anything about the directors, presumably. Yeah, that, that would be correct. And is there any evidence that they didn't think that Alan and Overy had got it right? Specifically, that Alan and Overy had not got it right? Um, no, in, in the sense that the SPA, and as your lordships will have already, as I understand it, already alive to, given the encouragement to us to look at Coroyne and Steeplechase and so on, there are, um, on a reading of the original SPA, it might be said, well, look, it has as one of its terms reference to the transfer provisions and so on, and compliance, and offering the opportunity to the AMB shareholders to, um, uh, to, to uh, make an offer for these shares. Um, does that mean that um, that the bank directors knew or should have known uh, or, or didn't know that um, this was uh, incompatible with the obligations of the bank. Uh, I would say no, that it, it doesn't absolve them. And that is all the more true when one gets to the 2018 annex, as we will see, because there are provisions in that that are on any view, um, provisions that should have raised red flags for a bank or for any director um, because they, they expressly bind the bank to not 
taking steps in the interest of the company. They essentially say to the bank, you shouldn't assist anyone who is um, how, looking to defend MJW, MJWK's claim against the company. As, a, 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 as I said, we'll look at it, but it's a fairly extraordinary provision for a shareholder to... We'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, as you just said, but just, just while we're on this question, where is that referred to in paragraph 67B? In paragraph 67B. Hmm. So the, uh, it's the... Let me just get to it. Put your lordship to it right at the moment. Can I come back to your lordship on that? I do understand the importance of that question um, because uh, we need to point your lordship to that. Um, I should wait, make one point, my lord, which is that, of course, we are <coughs> working on the basis of the materials that were before the judge, um, and uh, it is right to note that the PSPT information came became apparent only shortly before the hearing. So, uh, but I will. Can I come back to that, my lord? I, I really will set up, but just if the complaint were about the 2018 annex, that obviously wouldn't affect Mr. Taremcha because he wasn't a director by then, was he? No, he was the signatory, but he was the signatory to the original, the original SP. But if, if it were the case that any complaint had to be tied to the later um, uh, document, then that couldn't be a breach by him. Save insofar as it might be said that the 2018 annex uh, depended on the 2014 SBA and the failure to have alerted the company to that, knowingly failure to alert the company to the, the fact of the 2014 SBA, which then enabled the 2018 annex to be uh, implemented. But this, with respect, sounds very, very contrived. It, so suppose that there was nothing wrong with the 2014 SBA. <clears throat> yes. In those circumstances, yes, my lord. I mean, the mere fact that some time after Mr. Taremcha had ceased to be a director, something else was done. I'm not, no, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not making that point. Yeah. So, as I said, I was going to look at the subrogation claim and everything that flowed from that. Yes. And then the 2014 SBA and the 2018 annex and everything that flowed from that. Um, and, and it is important to bear in mind that the judge held that there was a prima facie case in relation to the uh, first to fifth defendants in these respects. So the subrogation claim is the foundation of the default judgment and thereby the first two bailiff sales. Um, and as we've discussed, it was the bailiff sales by then that pre ultimately lost control of um, uh, and ownership of the fund. And your lordships will have, or, or will no doubt already be alive to the, the, the numbers point that a theoretical debt uh, or an alleged debt of 16 million euros uh, has resulted in the loss of something in the region of certificates worth something in the region of 100 million euros. Um, and our submission, the bank played a critical role in enabling that uh, itself and through its directors. Um, and we will, I will explore that shortly. Um, both by its positive acts, but also in doing nothing to prevent the obvious wrong that was being perpetrated, um, despite, as we say, being aware of it, uh, as it must have been. <clears throat> now, on the subrogation claim, it is, again, worth noting that the judge made a number of important findings uh, with which we uh, agree um, about the involvement and the knowledge of the bank and its directors about critical matters. Um, and we can see these in his judgment at paragraph 105 and following. So that's page 87 of the core bundle. Uh, 
Um, so if we look at 87, we see the judge there said, first, although there appears to have been a legal basis for the subrogation claim, it appears unusual for what was in effect a wholly owned subsidiary of the fund to bring an action against the company which owned all the certificates in the fund. Further on, the evidence which has shown as to the value of the assets of the fund, the nature of the collateral agreement and the annex in relation to the value of the security granted relative to the amount of the debt do appear prima facie to be uncommercial and at least call for explanation. And then a third point, um, he notes that um, uh, he could, says that the absence of an explanation, I can see that the court could infer that the purpose of these steps was to enable MJWK and through it Vladek and Michael to obtain ownership and control of the certificates. <clears throat> and then he notes that um, it may well be the case collateral agreement did not itself cause the company any loss since the certificates were subsequently returned. But even if that's right, the evidence of conduct in relation to the commencement of the subrogation claim and the entry into the collateral agreement would, in my view, at least be at least potentially supportive of the claimant's claim arising out of the subsequent steps in the chronology. And then at 106, <clears throat> uh, he importantly notes that the default judgment is a key part of the chronology, as are the bailiff sales and the issuance of the new certificates. Um, and he notes that the timing of the default judgment appears odd. That's in the middle of that paragraph. <clears throat> and that the bailiff sales uh, on their face, that's in the next line, are on their face unusual. And those matters were a key basis for the judge's conclusion at paragraph 108 that the claimant had succeeded in demonstrating a prima facie case on its article 415 claims against uh, Vladik and Michael Yorosovich. <clears throat> um, and then as regards, um, as the findings regarding the awareness of the bank and its directors, we can see at 107, um, sorry, that's not the correct reference, uh, 117, at page 91, <clears throat> um, so he, he starts by saying there's no real evidence that the bank or the directors were involved in or aware of the steps being taken in relation to the grant of the 2016 POA or the entry into the collateral agreement, um, still less that they are aware of or a party to what is said to have been their intended purpose. And then importantly, they were aware that MJWK was paying the convertible bonds early <clears throat> and that such payment may not have been consistent with the arrangements put in place under the FFSA and the ESFA agreement. Um, and recall that he's also concluded that he can infer that the purpose of those steps was to enable Vladik and Michael to seize control of the certificates. And then he says there's also some evidence <clears throat> that the bank and Mr. de Mackay may have been aware that MJWK's purpose um, in making the payments, uh, in making the early uh, payments, was... Um, to enable it to bring a subrogated claim uh, against the company. <clears throat> now, there's an oddity here in paragraph 117 because the judge focuses on the 2016 POA and the collateral agreement. And this is one of the aspects we say where he's taking into account for this specific purpose <clears throat> irrelevant matters and not taking into account relevant matters. Because he rightly concludes over the page, as he'd already mentioned, that the entry of the default judgment was key, <clears throat> and then also the bail of sales and the issuance of new certificates. But of course, without the subrogation claim, the default judgment could not have been entered, and the first and second bail of sales could not have taken place. Um, and then the judge also reaches conclusions uh, on that uh, at 119 and 120. Now, we draw these points together in our skeleton argument, and for interests of time, it may be uh, simpler to look at them in this way. At paragraph 27 of our skeleton, which is at page 198 of the bundle. 198 to 199. So I might just ask your lordships to read that, just paragraph 27 through to the beginning of 
paragraph 28. So, so those are the important aspects of the judge's uh, reasoning. Uh, and what I want to do now, just focusing on the subrogation claim, is look at the convertible bond repayment process and what in fact happened and the bank's role in that. Uh, on the convertible bond repayment process, but that's some way from arguing about whether the bank was wrong to accept early payment, which is the key to this, isn't it? Well, it's, it, it's, this is the process which should have been abided by. And so it is directly relevant to the question of whether the bank was wrong to accept some other route of payment. I don't follow that. So the, 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 you say the bank had no contractual entitlement to early payment, but well, that must be right. And the documents I suspect you're about to take is to show that it wasn't yet, con the payment wasn't yet contractually due. Is that right? Uh, the, it's in fact to show, I mean, in summary, it's to show that the critical decisions in the repayment process were decisions for pre for the company. Well, and in fact, what happened in a process which the bank agreed with uh, was that that decision making was taken away from the bank, sorry, taken away from the company, and uh, exercised by a subsidiary to the bank's knowledge and with the bank knowing what the proper procedure was. I mean, I'll, you take your course in one moment, but taking it by stages, first of all, as a matter of common sense, in an ordinary case where a creditor is offered payment early, it does nothing wrong if it, if it accepts that payment. In this particular case, the bank did hesitate to take payment from the subsidiary company, was told by Denton's that it had an obligation to do so, and it accepted payment. Um, it isn't an obvious inference that they accepted payment for some nefarious purpose. One would think, well, they had a contractual right to take early payment, and um, here they're told that they actually have a legal obligation to, to, to take early payment. Um, and then, I don't wish you to forget in all this, what the pleading is. Is there any pleaded complaint about the subrogation claim? Um, so I, 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 I mean, in answer, yes, my lord. Um, can I it, it, join yes, that we'll together? Come to that later, but yes. I would like at some stage to see what is pleaded, yes. how it is pleaded that the bank mm -hmm. acted wrongly in accepting early payment. Yes. Um, so what I want to do, my lord, and your lordship <clears throat> made uh, commented that there's no nothing contractually wrong with um, accepting early repayment. So in our submission, the the under the terms of the SSA, the bank uh, wasn't compliant with its obligations by accepting payment in the way it did, which was early. And uh, and I say that in general in. A, setting it in outline, <clears throat> the parties had set up a sophisticated uh, <clears throat> process by which the convertible bonds were going to be repaid, which <clears throat> was set out in the SSA, which then led, um, in pursuant to that, led to an agreement in the form of the FFSA, <clears throat> pursuant to which there was an escrow agreement as well. And so those are the three key relevant contractual documents 
the SSA, the FFSA and the escrow accounts agreement, the bank is, and PRI, the company, are party to each of those. What it's also relevant to note is that the, none of the target companies are um, parties to those. And when I say target companies, those are the subsidiary companies. That's just the name that they were given in the schedule in the SSA. Um, and the target companies <coughs> had no obligations to the bank. Um, to repay the convertible bonds. There were certain uh, obligations on them to set up accounts uh, and, and so on, but they don't actually owe sums to the bank <clears throat> to repay the convertible bonds. The role of the target companies was merely to enable PRE to repay the convertible bonds. The target companies were PRE's agents or vehicles, as one describes it, for that purpose. So if we, if we turn up the SSA, the relevant part is the Third Amendment, which is at, 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 in the supplemental bundle at page 134 and following. So, and if we turn to... Clause 4 at uh, page SB139, we see at 4.4, the company at PRE shall pay the capital and accrued interest on the convertible bonds in accordance with the following timetable. And there's a, a six monthly uh, timetable and with a minimum, minimum amount. So the important point there. Pre is to make the repayment. Then, <clears throat> if we uh, go to go back a page to clause three point one, uh, or about two pages to clause three point one, and we see that um, under so three point one, the company shall procure that at the latest on the twenty second of July, and then it's going to do certain steps. It's it's. Uh, uh, it's going to procure that certain accounts and so on are opened. And we see at um, E, and, or D rather, each of the target companies opens a blocked account with the investor. There's a special account. E, um, Alpha Real Estate opens an account. Um, and G, each of the target companies will enter into pledge agreements um, under which they will establish financial pledges over all the special accounts. Um, and Alpha Real Estate Fizz, that's the fund, will open escrow accounts to secure the repayment and payment of the investors' claims under the convertible bonds. So essentially, PRE's got to repay these sums. <clears throat> PRE sets up or procures that the target companies set up accounts, and it procures that the target companies pledge any sums in those accounts uh, to the bank. Now, what's critical is what sums go into those accounts. And that's a, 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 a decision for PRE, as we will see. <clears throat> so we see at 3.2 of the SSA, on page 138, the company shall provide annually to the investor the annual budget for the group, no later than the end of November, and, and then if we go forward to 4.5, this is page 139, the company, that's pre, shall procure that all excess cash flow and all disposal proceeds as defined in the FFSA, whether or not they're transferred to the special accounts, um, will be used to repay the convertible bonds on each repayment date. And we know what the repayment dates are. Um, uh, we've seen those, and that's also defined in the FFSA. <clears throat> and there's a minimum amount. And if we turn now to the FFSA, which is at, um, starts at page 151. Sorry, just before we move on. Yeah. 
is is it your case that it's a breach of this agreement for the company to pay early? Uh, to pay in the way it did, which was early. So I'm sorry, I don't understand that answer. I'm sure I'm being dense here. The, they they were obliged to pay. Let's say take first payment, twenty sixth July, twenty thirteen. If they pay on the twenty fifth of July, one day early, is that a breach? Uh, no. The the company is, it's it's a decision for the company, to to decide how it's going to repay the convertible bonds. If the company decides that it wants to discharge its debt to the bank early, then I wouldn't envisage that that would be a breach. But you, are, are you suggesting that looking at the SSA in this <laughs> form, it would be a breach of contract for the bank to accept payment early? From pre? Well, from anyone. From pre, no. And with pre's consent, no. Well, let's assume there's no consent. Is there, a, do you say it is a breach of this contract for the bank to accept early repayment from someone else? Or indeed any repayment from someone else? Well, if it's not in accordance with <clears throat> the terms of the contract, uh, yes, but, uh, and the reason I say that is this, my lord, just to explain it. As we will see, there's quite a careful process by which the sums are calculated. One could envisage a situation <clears throat> where some other person within the group takes it on themselves without informing Pre to repay the entire amount which has the consequence of causing pre some real difficulty, um, financial or otherwise, because suddenly 16 million euros has left the group structure and pre had no say over that. And, th and it's for that reason that pre and the bank, along with the other shareholders, agreed that the process by which repayment was to take place was one which the company ultimately controlled, subject to the repayment timetable and the bank's final maturity date. I mean, on the face of it, I have to say, looking at the provisions you've shown us, it looks as though this is imposing obligations on the company. Um, if, as I understand it to be the case, you say it is a breach of this agreement for the bank to accept payment from anyone else, which term do you say imposes that obligation on the bank? So the, it's the, the agreement is that the company is going to procure the excess cash flows um, at 4.5 uh, and they're going to be paid or, or as defined in the FFSA. Uh, also, as we see, um, the, <clears throat> the company is to procure the structure that's to be set up by which the um, payments are to be made. Um, and we see also that the company is to procure at 3.3, the terms and conditions of the convertible bonds are amended in accordance with this deed. So is there any provision saying that the bank can't do any of these things? The bank can't accept payment for anyone else? Well, we will see that in in the FFSA, to yes, which the bank is also a party. But of course, what this English law document does is essentially set up the structure, which includes the FFSA and the escrow agreements. So then we turn to the FFSA to look at what, what happens. And I, I understand your Lordship's point, which is <clears throat> what's restricting the bank just to give a, a high level view before I delve into the detail. As I say, there is an obligation on the bank not to, to abide by this process, the process that's been agreed. Well, you say that. <laughs> what obligation are you referring to? So, well, OK, let, let's look at it in the FFSA. So, so Maybe you... better that I take your lordship yes, yes. and then summarise it afterwards. So if we look at, um, <clears throat> starts at page 151. And then we see at clause 3A, um, so the company is to calculate 
the amount of the excess cash flow. This is at page 156. Calculate the amount of the excess cash flow. So that's on pre. Nobody else is, is to do that. Um, and then at D, the company is to provide the investor, that's the bank, with any information which the investor may reasonably request to calculate any excess cash flow. And then E, an auditor, is to carry out a review uh, of those, uh, of the f audited financial statements. And the company, just on the bottom right under the signature, the company will provide the investor with the original of the statement each year. <coughs> and that's to be provided um, by, by pre. Now, then if we look at 4.1, 4.1b, each, um, the, t the company, that's pre, is to procure that each target company shall deposit the excess cash flow amount calculated by pre on its special account. And pre is to procure this. And then 4.1b, um, the company, sorry, I, was, I think I said 4.1b. Um, apologies. Yes, that's right. 4.1b, um, the company is to procure the target company deposits on its special account the amount of excess cash flow calculated, and that's of course calculated by pre, and also um, uh, any um, uh, disposal amounts. That's for the, from the sale of asset. Uh, and if we look at 4.2a, each target company, that's each subsidiary, on each day on which any amount is paid to a special account, will transfer all such amounts to the bank as a bank security deposit, and all such sums um, <clears throat> will be released from the bank security of deposit to the escrow account. Um, so there's a carefully considered mechanism here as to how these sums are to, to be calculated and how they're to find their way to the bank. And I mean, then this, we this see... This all looks to be for the protection of the bank. Is there in here any obligation well, on the bank not to accept payment any other way? Well, ju just on that, my Lord. So just, just thinking about it, in terms of um, an interpretation, just reading, reading the SSA um, as an English law contract, but also just as a matter of common sense, looking at the FFSA as a Polish law contract, as I say, the bank must be under an obligation, we would say, whether it's on a proper construction of this contract or um, by reason of an implied term, uh, I, I, but I suggest one doesn't need to go that far, in circumstances where there is a mechanism set up by which the the, the, uh, um, the amount that is to be paid to the bank each half year is to be calculated by reference to the um, by reference to the the uh, essentially the cash flows and just for your lordship's uh, reference the excess cash flow is defined at page one five four of the bundle and. and in short, it, it's pretty obvious. It's it's sums that are um, coming in, less sums that are going out, but also, of course, sums that may be going out in future. It's a, we would suggest, a protection for pre, plainly intended to uh, protect or benefit pre, to prevent a situation where um, too much money is repaid to the bank too early, leaving pre in a situation where um, it essentially has insufficient cash flow to meet its obligations. <clears throat> and so that's, as a starting point, I said, just as a matter of construction of the contracts, one one logic as a matter of commercial common sense gets there. That's point one. I mean, point just, just pausing there. Um, I see that this is governed by Polish law, but we don't have any evidence from Polish law in this respect, do we, as to contractual construction? Not, not specifically on that, but if one goes back to the SSA, 
one one gets by English law. one gets there anyway because the the SSA establishes for you the FFSA structure and and then <clears throat> just pausing on the SSA it shouldn't be forgotten my lord that the judge below concluded that <clears throat> this is the kind of contract relational contract in which a duty of good faith uh, does arise and <clears throat> excuse me in that sense we would say that it's not just a case of the bank um, <clears throat> sitting there waiting for its money. The bank is under a duty of good faith. And that duty of good faith, in my submission, must extend to ensuring that a carefully considered <clears throat> and set out uh, process by which payments are to be calculated and made, both as to the value and the timing, um, that that should be adhered to. And if it's not, <clears throat> that at the very least, it needs to inform the company of that. Well, no, 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 no leave it. So the, is the escrow accounts agreement of the same kind? Yes. So um, if we just, uh, just before we get there, my lord, <clears throat> now the FFSA, uh, the reason I want to take this, there's two, two points. I can probably make them shortly because your lordships will be able to read the FFSA and the escrow agreement in more detail. But the two points that I want to make are, are these. One, uh, and they both go to discharge of liabilities. One is that this mechanism that is set up, of course, addresses pre's discharge of its liabilities to the bank. But perhaps more importantly, the structure also addresses and provides a, provides a mechanism for the discharge of the fund's liabilities to pre. So ordinarily, in a, this investment structure, funds that are coming out of the properties in Poland, rent or sales or whatever they might be, feed up through the fund to pre. And there are what are described in the escrow agreement as pre-receivables, the sums that pre would be entitled to receive. Now, by this mechanism, payments that are calculated in accordance with the agreed mechanism and paid through the special accounts and the escrow account through to... Uh, the bank and it, the bank's specific bond account, those sums, which PRE has calculated, stand to satisfy and thereby discharge the fund's liabilities to PRE. And <clears throat> it would therefore, we submit, be incumbent upon the bank in circumstances where there has been this carefully set out process to ensure that that is abided by because the consequence of it not doing so is that suddenly pre without input into the process will find that a debt that it is owed by the fund has been discharged without its knowledge without any input on the part of pre and again that could leave it in financially financially difficult position or indeed create other other problems uh, and I might just take your lordship straight to that latter point um, if we turn to um, if we just turn to the escrow agreement Um, and if we turn to the escrow agreement, which starts at page 151. Uh, 164. Sorry, my apologies. In fact, sorry, my lord. What, can, can we actually just go back to yes. the FFSA just while I'm there? I, I was looking at the wrong, wrong document. Um, at 157 of, of that document, <clears throat> we see that um, the, <clears throat> the FFSA provides that the escrow account agreement, which we're going to come to, shall include a mechanism which will ensure that such transfers to the investor will be directly or indirectly used towards the payment of outstanding capital and accrued interest on the convertible bonds. In other words, the bank is obliged to <clears throat> use that mechanism for the purpose of uh, repaying uh, or, or paying off the bonds and thereby <clears throat> um, satisfying the or having the, the debt from pre to the bank satisfied. 
So now on the escrow agreement at page 164, if we, if we just turn up um, at two, the clause two, well, I might just take your lordship, uh, I mentioned about pre-receivable. You can see that in recital A on page 165. So the fund shall receive, and then it lists the various target companies, financial resources by way of dividend payment or advance payment towards dividend or payment from supplementary capital and so on. And that's the fund's receivables and intends to pay to pre-income or revenue of the fund received uh, from sale or redemption of certificates of the fund, that's pre's receivables, and pre intends to use the obtained financial resources to pay off the debts on account of the bonds. So that's the, 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 the chain that I was uh, discussing. Um, and then we have at, at paragraph uh, clause two, um, we see that uh, there's essentially two escrow accounts set up, um, and one is a uh, Polish Zloty, I think, uh, account, and one is a Euro account. Um, and the relevant, particularly relevant clause is clause 2 sub 3, which is on page 166. Subject to the provisions of paragraph 3 below, regarding the possibility of conversion, the bank shall release the escrow amount into bond service account number by the end of next working day after delivery to the bank before expiry period and so on, um, uh, on the payment of income of the or the revenue of the fund from the sale of investment or redemption of the certificates of the fund to which the attachment of the resolution of the assembly of investors, uh, I think that means a, a shareholders uh, agreement, shall apply if the resolution of the, uh, sorry, of the shareholders meeting is required by the statute of the fund, and that's the resolution and the resolution shall be introduced to the bank in the original version or a copy certified by a notary. And the bank shall release the escrow amount in the amount specified in the resolution. And the fund is entitled to submit further resolutions during the term of the agreement. The parties agree that the release of the escrow amount by the bank uh, into the above on service account shall consequently satisfy pre receivables. So that's, that's the um, uh, pre uh, to the... Um, Sorry, that's the fund to pre, because as we see, pre's receivables were the fund's debts to pre. So the situation where one has is that, uh, as I've said, it's critical that pre was able to determine what these sums were, because by payment of the convertible bonds, not only was MJWK uh, reducing the assets in the fund, but it was also bypassing a route by which the fund was cancelling debts to pre, um, and so in circumstances where the payment of fund excess cash flows via this mechanism was supposed to cancel a debt to pre, it's difficult to see, we would say, on what conceivable legitimate basis payment of cash flows could create a debt from pre to the subsidiary. And the bank and the directors must have been aware of that. And they we, not just aware, but they would have been aware, uh, we would suggest, of their obligation as a matter of construction of the SSA, at least, and the SSA procuring the FFSA and the escrow agreement. <clears throat> the bank was under an obligation to ensure that it complied with that, and at the very least, if there was to be a departure, that that would be still in accordance with uh, the, uh, with, or sorry, it would still be with Pre's consent, so that Pre was not left in a situation where it had debts to it discharged without its knowledge and in amounts that it had not agreed to, and where there was a risk that the fund might be left with inadequate cash flows. <clears throat> and we would suggest that that is, at the very least, a term that arises out of its good faith ob obligations um, and or clause 24.1.
or VSSA. Um, Sorry, uh, clause 24.1. And this was a clause that the judge looked at in the judgment. And your logic will find that. You won't find it in the Third Amendment. You'll find it back in the original, which is at SB 28. Now, that, that's a, a provision that the, the judge uh, held was sufficient. I'll just find the reference. And I'll, to, paragraph 133 of the judgment. That's page 95 of the core bundle. The judge said... <clears throat> The terms of the SSA do not expressly state the undertakings and duties in the terms pleaded by the claimant. However, I would accept that where clause 24.1 refers to each party exercising all powers and rights available to it as a director, officer, employee, or shareholder in the company in the required manner, this extends to the conduct of directors appointed by that party. At the very least, there is, in my view, a prima facie case to that effect. Now, that, of course, holds true for today's purposes, just as it did in front of the judge. That doesn't depend on um, his decision that there's a prima facie case only against D's 1 to 5. That is a, a, that's a prima facie case as to interpretation of the SSA. I'm, I'm not sure why this comes into this argument. Um, the question is whether the bank was wrong to accept early payment. Yes. Where does... Clause twenty four point one. So I, I, I'll, I appreciate that, my lord. I will. I will build on it. What the judge then goes on to do is then uh, at the paragraphs leading up to um, uh, uh, paragraph one four three, he addresses the, the relational contract aspect, and at one three eight. He notes that uh, that at least some in the middle of that paragraph, at least some of those characteristics are satisfied in the present case. Um, I don't see that there are any specific express terms in the SSA which prevent a duty of good faith being implied. Um, and uh, at one three nine, there's a prima facie case. Um, and then 140, assuming as I do that the claimant is right that there is a prima facie case on its construction of the SSA, <clears throat> then it follows from what I've already found that there is a prima facie case. That this is a brief one. Um, but then at 141, and we'll come to this later when we look at the SSA claim, that the, the, he concludes that there isn't a prima facie case that the bank breached 24, uh, clause 24.1. But, but to for the purposes of, of, of my submissions today, my point is that, that the judge was wrong there. And the reason he was wrong, because if one looks at those materials that I have just looked at and taken your lordships through, in terms of the mechanism that's set up and the obvious consequences, if that mechanism, mechanism is not abided by, and the obvious consequences of, what, of pre- not having any say in any departure from that mechanism. The bank's good faith obligations required it to either abide by that mechanism, that's the direct answer to your Lordship's question, or if it wanted it to depart from it, <clears throat> and specifically if it wanted to depart from it in the way it did, that it obtained Pree's consent to do so. So, so can, can we just pause there a moment? Um, so, so as I understand it, <clears throat> both by virtue of the good faith obligation, which you say uh, is implicit in the SSA, or by virtue of the specific terms of the Third Amendment uh, and the allied FFSA and escrow accounts agreement, the bank was not entitled contractually to accept payment in the way it did. Now, is that pleaded? Yes, my lord, it's, uh, I can find that. Uh, 
out. So the, the way, the, as your lordship asking specifically as regards the SSA English law obligations, because well, uh, what I'm concerned with is you say the bank acted in breach of contract in accepting the payment that it did. Therefore, we must look to the pleading to see what it says about how the bank acted in breach of contract in accepting the payment in that way. Yeah. <clears throat> so we see um, at paragraph 80 of the uh, SSA, uh, sorry, of the APOC, uh, which is at page 175 of the core bundle. <clears throat> Uh, as a result of the facts and matters set out above, of course that's in general terms, but that does bring in the facts that have been set out, which include the uh, facts set out in respect of the uh, of the um, of the subrogation claim. <clears throat> And so, first of all, just, just pausing at 80, and as a result of the facts and matters set out above, um, we have getting the segregation thing. I can just turn that, my lord. At 67B2, which is at page 169, we have the reference to the bank's initial reluctance to allow an early repayment of the convertible bonds, that they suspected that the proposal was part of a plan to procure the subrogation claim. And I'm going to come to this in a second because this is another. So there's two aspects to this. One, those those uh, obligations that I mentioned, you can apply them simply to the departure from the agreed mechanism on its face. Then you can also apply them to the departure from the agreed mechanism with knowledge of, uh, or at least um, an understanding of what that was leading to, namely the subrogation claim by a subsidiary against PRI. Now, at the moment we're on for stage one, was the bank contractually obliged not yes. to take payment? And this doesn't say that, does it? Was the bank contractually obliged not to take payment? It is, what is pleaded at 80 is that the bank breached clause 24.1 by reason <coughs> of uh, the bank, and at the end of 67B2, the bank ultimately deciding to accept the early repayment of the convertible bonds. So, so just pausing there, 24.1 doesn't really seem to have anything to do with it. Um, how did the bank breach 24.1? I'm sorry, my lord. The clause 24.1 says that the bank, for this purpose, undertakes that it will exercise all its powers and duties <clears throat> to give effect to the provisions of the agreement. Um, so how can there be a breach of 24.1? So the bank is liable... Um, it's liable for, you say, for... The conduct of its directors. Yes, but it's a bank that, entered, that takes the payment. It's no, no, no breach of duty by the directors to on, take the payment. On this narrower initial point... Yes. Uh, uh, so is I, it clear that the bank acted in yeah. breach of contract in accepting the payment? And if so, on what basis? Yes. And then <clears throat> we can see that... Um, I'll, I'm going to come back to that in a second, my lord. Then we can see that... <clears throat> In particular, given that paragraph 80 says the bank breached, etc., in that, so we understand that, that the alleged breaches are those that are set out in subparagraphs A, B, and C. Yes. And A and B have nothing to do with this because they're conduct of the directors, whereas you say there's a breach by the bank in accepting payment. 
Yes, but pursuant to, uh, and as the, ju as the judge held at 141 of his judgment, the conduct of Mr. Cheremcher and Mr. De Mackay, as pleaded at 80A1 um, and 2 and 3, is referable to the bank under clause 24.1. Fine, but that has nothing to do with this, because the question is, does the bank have an obligation not to take payment? It's nothing to do with attributing the conduct of the nominees to the bank. Well, so the question is, is it pleaded that the bank was contractually obliged not to take payment? And if so, on what basis? Uh, I think the answer to that is no, but is it pleaded that the bank was in breach by taking payment, which brings with it, of course, the, the inference that there was an obligation not to do that, then yes. So where uh, is I, that? I accept that's not an ideal way to, to set out a, a pleading, but that... Where, where is that to be found? <clears throat> so by saying that the bank breached... Clause 24.1 at paragraph 80. But then we see how it's said to be yes. in A, B, and C. And A and B can't be relevant. Is C relevant? So, well, A can be relevant, my lord, because the, the, the point being made here is that the bank itself is accepting payment in part through the conduct. Uh, and I, I, I see your lordship's point about the receipt of payment on its own is, is an act of the bank. But um, and, and insofar as either of these people signed anything, they'll have signed as, as uh, an officer of the bank. Of the bank. So I can't quite see how A has anything to do with it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, my lord, I'm going to have to come back on that that particular point. Um, we we will conduct a thorough review of the pleading on the various points that your lordship has said raised this morning at lunchtime. Um, <clears throat> I think the the more um, obvious route is the bank's knowledge, um, which triggers, in particular, we would submit the good faith obligations uh, uh, when it's fairly clear to the bank that what is going on is not in the interests of the company and is not in accordance with the agreed mechanism. So, and so can we pause there? <laughs> so we assume for this purpose that the bank is contractually entitled to take payment, as it did. But it does so in circumstances where it knows or suspects that the payment will be used to mount a subrogation claim. Is that a breach of duty? But on the part of the on bank. On the part of the bank. Uh, I, I would submit yes, my lord. Um, and the, the the basis being at least that um, as a matter of construction of the SSA. <clears throat> the bank was under an obligation not to take steps outside the agreed repayment mechanism in circumstances where, and I'll just pause there, if I stop there, that's that's your lordship's first point, you know, is there a contractual obligation to um, accept payment uh, out in any other way <clears throat> or to accept early repayment? But this second point is it's under an obligation not to accept uh, payment where, in circumstances where that pay repayment will cause, will incur a debt on the part of PRE to a subsidiary in circumstances where, the, on, as the bank knows, ordinarily it would discharge a debt from the fund to now, two questions then, or maybe more than two, but certainly two. Um, one, I've seen from the exhibits to the witness statement that the bank was under pressure to accept payment from the subsidiary. Uh, Denton said, you've got to, that's Polish law. Um, now, on the facts, how does one infer that when the bank accepts payment having been threatened in that way, it had any nefarious purpose. And uh, supposing that that is the case, where what is pleaded about that? So just, just to be clear, um, nefarious purpose for the purposes of the SSA test, the SSA claim, there's no need for any nefarious conduct. It's simply a question of whether it's in breach, breach of the SSA or not. Well, which, which clause are you saying would be breached by accepting payment as you were in contractually entitled to do in circumstances where you know that the uh, payment will then be used to bring a subrogation claim. 
Well, so we're back to the, the discussion. So 24.1 and the conduct of the directors, but then we are into... This isn't conduct of directors, is it? Is it the directors don't come into it. And then we're into clause, and then we're into the good faith obligation. So, so it's a bad, bad is, faith for, in that sense. So you say it can be inferred that the bank acted in bad faith by accepting payment as it was contractually entitled to do in circumstances where it knew that the payment was going to give rise to a subrogation claim, even though it had been told that under Polish law it had to. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm going to go through that now. And, and that's pleaded, is it? Uh, so again, my lord, if I could address those points after the short adjournment, that may be the sensible way of doing that. So, <clears throat> my lord, the, I may try and do this before a short adjournment, is to run through the factual story on that early repayment. And then I would hope that that clarifies for your lordship some of these questions, particularly on this second aspect. <clears throat> uh, so we can... If we turn to Mr. Rutter's first statement, which was before the judge, um, and that's at, in the supplemental bundle that starts at page 259. And if we could turn to page nine, uh, sorry, page 267 from paragraph 94. So, there was a meeting on the 9th of March, 2015, um, that uh, the other directors were unaware of. Um, and at that meeting, uh, there was a, a discussion about a proposed transaction where the bank was to grant a credit facility to MJWK of 16.5 million. Um, and uh, that uh, was in respect to the convertible bonds. And there's also then discussion at C of PSPT transferring 8 million <clears throat> for the shares. Essentially, the bank's looking to get out. And so there's 16 million euros worth of convertible bonds and 8 million euros worth of shares. And the, really, the story of this entire dispute is the bank trying to exit. And um, because it wants to, in short, taking whatever steps it considered necessary to assist that end, even those which it was aware uh, were steps that uh, were enabling Vladik and Michael to seize control of and the value of the company. Um, and then, uh, if your lordships could read paragraph 95 of Mr. Rota's statement, which goes over the page. And then um, we're going to move to paragraph 101, where <clears throat> Mr. Rosa sets out that he now knows that on the 1st of July, there was a partial repayment by MJWK in the sum of nearly 8 million euros. <clears throat> and 
there was a confirmation from the bank on the 6th of July that this had happened. <clears throat> and then at 102, um, we have reference to uh, a letter from, or email from Martin Tofel to the bank, which your lordship referred to and we'll look at shortly, um, setting out what it said was the provisions of Polish law and requiring the bank to, to uh, accept payment. And then at 103, Mr. Rhodes says, I now understand that a meeting did occur um, with the bank in Warsaw on the 16th of September 2015, uh, in which Mr. de Mackay, uh, Michael Jurasovic, and Marcin Tofel were in attendance. It appears that after this meeting, the bank changed its tune and was willing to accept repayments of the political bond. I do not know why the bank completely changed its approach, but I imagine it had something to do with trying to achieve their exit, <coughs> uh, um, having that completed as soon as possible. Now, if we might just look at some of the underlying materials, because it does help. Um, if we could turn in the same part of the bundle to page 289, we see an email from Christoph Pavla. Uh, and if, you want, if your lordships look at his email address, <coughs> it's at JWK Group or Grupa. So the JWK group is the, is the group that is essentially the Vladek and Michael group um, in which Anna Banderska plays a key role. And it's to the bank and copied to another, uh, to Agnieszka at the bank and copied to a Richard at the bank. Dear says, we are very pleased to notify, you, notify of you our, our willingness to proceed to settle your bond subscription with the JWK group, which is a little odd given the bond, of course, was with... The, the, the company with Pre, we'd like to proceed with relevant payment. We're asking you to sign the attach, the re, uh, return the attached certificate which has been prepared on the basis of a new, previously mutually agreed promise, which would appear to be a reference to the earlier meetings, one of which we saw in Warsaw. Um, <clears throat> so even then, just, just looking at that, and, and, the way in which that's presented, the bank would know that that's outside of the agreed mechanism. And then if we go to the previous page, which is the reply to that um, from the bank, it says at page 288, on the 9th of September, um, Clementina Levchuk at Raffleson writes to Mr. Polak at JWK and Michael Yurosevich, copied to Mr. de Mackay at the bank, and various other individuals at the bank. So again, no, no involvement, which one would think would be um, uh, sensible of anyone else, <clears throat> uh, any of the other shareholders in pre. Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, with reference to the following correspondence, I'd like to inform you that the redemption of the bonds at earlier dates than those indicated in the FFSA agreement will be possible after an appropriate statement is submitted by the bond issuer pre. So just pausing there, that is exactly the submission that I'm making today about <clears throat> the obligation that the bank was under, that if it was going to depart from the agreed mechanism, that could only be with the consent of PRI, for the various reasons I've set out. <clears throat> um, and then uh, about Adela Kavijinska being responsible and listing Mr. de Mackay as legal counsel, who will soon replace President Jan Cheremcha as director on the Pre board. So the bank was fully aware that this was earlier than the repayment timetable agreed in the FSA, as would have been Mr. de Mackay, as would have been Mr. Cheremcha. Also aware that Pre had not consented, also aware, um, as they state in terms, that Pre needed to consent to this. And that then leads to the letter um, which your Lordship referred to at 287, so the previous page again, this is from Mr. Tofel. Again, it's, uh, so it's two, a uh, uh, copy to Mr. De Mackay, and then it's two various individuals, uh, Vladek and Michael and the JWK group, but again, no one else, none of the other shareholders or board members. <clears throat> um, And then <coughs> Mr. Tofel says, we're surprised to learn that the bank... Let me ask you this. Sorry, ma'am. Let me ask you this. Dr. Tofel yeah. states in this email that by virtue of 
the applicable legal provisions, the creditor, here the bank, may not refuse to accept performance from a third party even if it acts without the debtor's knowledge. Is it your client's case that that is wrong in law? Uh, yes, my lord. Where is that pleaded? So, and and yeah. is, this, is, is it your client's case that Dr. Tofall made that statement in bad faith? We, and that his bad faith is to be attributed to the bank? Well, Mr. Tofall is from Dentums, and we, we certainly uh, haven't made that uh, suggestion. Um, and at the moment, that's not necessary, my lord. It's, it's not a, a necessary part of our case. One could envisage a situation what, where what, someone in good sin, faith... You, you, you've told me that you allege that he's wrong in law, but you're inviting the inference, as I understand it, the bank knew that he was wrong in law. If I, I the bank to know that? So th one needs to take it in stages, my lord. So the bank's obligations in this respect are English law obligations. And well, the some of them are English law, some of them are Polish law. In the underlying agreements, but the relevant obligation that I'm addressing right now is the English law obligation under the SSA. And I am not saying, um, and at the moment we don't need to say, that Mr. Tofel is necessarily wrong as a matter of Polish law. The point is, what the bank's position is as a matter of English law under the SSA. I mean, just, just pausing there. As a matter of English law, as I understand it, uh, payment by somebody other than the debtor won't discharge the debt. So if English law applies, the debt still stands. Um, uh, I'm not sure where that would go. But... Um, uh, the parties seem to be proceeding on the basis that this was a matter of Polish law, and as I understand it, there is no evidence that Dr. Tofel is wrong about this. No, not, not at the moment. <clears throat> so, as I... As I so, the point is that the SSA, <clears throat> uh, as I said, is an English law contract. And to the, to the extent that we are talking about <clears throat> Polish law in this respect, it's whether steps were being taken by the bank which made it liable under Article 415 or Article 422 of the Polish Civil Code in the sense of awareness of wrongdoing on the part of, uh, of others, in particular Vladek and Michael, matters which the judge has already found were prima facie in breach of their, their duties of, um, of Polish law. It, it, so it is this a bit particular... this because it's, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty clear, though others will doubtless check, that as a matter of English law, if someone other than the debtor pays without the creditors, uh, without the actual debtor's authorization, the debt is not discharged. And were that the case here, were it right to apply English law, there could have been no subrogation claim because no debt would have been discharged. Yeah. So the subrogation claim rests on Polish law. And under Polish law, we're told the bank had no choice but to accept the payment. Yeah. And so the, the question is, what uh, at this stage should the bank have done pursuant to its English law obligations? And splitting it up again into the, <clears throat> the questions that your Lordship asked, the two, the two aspects. Was the bank entitled to accept the payment or uh, at least consider that, um, oh, proceed on the basis that there was a subrogation claim being, being um, brought on this basis? The bank, um, in our submission, ought at the very least to have alerted the company to what was going on, and it didn't. So, why? Because, plainly, uh, I would submit that if you know <clears throat> that, so you, you, the bank, you know that you have agreed this um, relatively complex mechanism for repayment of convertible bonds, which contains within it, doesn't matter which applicable law it is, but contains within it um, 
procedures which are obviously intended to enable the company sitting at the top to control that process, both as to the value uh, and as to debts that are uh, otherwise due to the company. Uh, you are aware that there's a process that, that's been agreed, and you're a party to those agreements. You're aware that there's going to be a departure from that. Uh, as a matter of common sense and plain commercial common sense under the English law con contractual rules, but also as a matter of good faith, in my submission, that uh, makes it incumbent upon the bank to inform the company what is going on. So the bank thinks I've got no choice but to accept the payment okay, I've got the payment, I'm now going to tell the company what's going on. Could I just what? ask, sorry, it's, it's my, a, after my yes. speech, sorry. <laughs> well, Why would that have helped? Because the whole point was that the, uh, the uh, PREI was going to know what was going on because the subrogation claim was going to be brought. Well, because it depends at what stage you, you make the company aware. The company could have taken any number of steps one, one could envisage. So you mean that the... the, the the complaint is that the bank had an obligation to tell PREI before it accepted payment. Um, perhaps put it the other way around. The bank had an obligation to ensure that if any steps were being taken that had the potential to harm PRE, that it informed PRE it sufficiently in advance that PRE would be able to take such steps as were necessary, either to block that action, because of course... MJWK is Pre's subsidiary. Sorry, my lord, I have a question. Or, or to protect itself. But the most obvious thing is, is that the, the bank would say, um, I'm, the, the first, I mean, the very first obligation on the bank one would contend would be to, in accordance Assuming, assuming that Mr. Tofel was right and that there were these Polish law obligations, to take such steps as it could, because, of course, it's not being said that the bank has to accept it right here and now. You know, there's, there's, all, there's presumably time to permit the bank to allow the company to know what was going on to avoid this situation. But it's important not to forget, not to lose sight of the fact this is September 2015. This has already been going on for nearly nine months, um, if not longer. The bank was under that obligation from the outset. So one would never have got to this position where a Polish lawyer is saying to the bank, these are your Polish law obligations, you've got to do this or else. You'd never have got to that situation because the bank would have told the company about this many months earlier and the company would have been in a position to take such steps as to prevent it getting to this stage. And I rudely stopped my Lord from asking I'm this sorry, question. I'm sorry, I went my, on. My, my, my question is really about this um, email at 287, which seems to me to say three things. The first is that um, the applicable law is Polish law by the, the Rome one. We needn't detain ourselves with whether that's right or wrong, that's what it's saying. Secondly, it says that um, under the actual law, if a monetary claim is due, the creditor may not refuse to accept payment forms. So that, that paragraph about which my Lord Lord Justice Arnold asked you ends um, with the proposition that creditor may not refuse to accept the performance that is already due. Um, and that goes on, the next paragraph goes on to explain that. And then the second sentence of the third paragraph says that However, the bank may voluntarily accept the benefit of repayment um, earlier, before it becomes due. So my, my question was really whether we've been working on a misunderstanding hmm. of this email. Whether it's due. Because the um, SSA tells us when it's due. Probably, <laughs> whatever the applicable law is, <laughs> that wouldn't affect the, the, uh, the answer to that. Um, Indeed, and it, there's a... There's a I'm not, I'm not, this is not a proposition, it's a question. Yeah, well, uh, your Lordship, is, is, uh, um, that is an important observation because, of course, what this presupposes <clears throat> and uh, is that there is a sum due to the bank. And... Well, except my Lord's question is directed to the third 
paragraph, which is about the situation before it becomes due. Yeah. But he also says in that context, PRE's consent is not necessary to accept such repayment. So he is asserting that the bank is able to accept early payment without PRE's consent. Yeah. And that is what is being posited by Mr. Tofel. Um, um, uh, but of course, the, the critical word there, which Mr. Tofel uh, makes, is voluntarily. <clears throat> There's no obligation on the bank to do that. Well, so right, but there's no obligation not to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 so one then falls back to, well, what are its obligations? So we're in a situation where the bank has agreed a process for payment. Um, if this is right, it's obliged to accept payment where, where a payment has fallen due. <clears throat> but if it has not yet become due, it may do so. Our submission is that, in the first place, it ought not to have done so, but on any view, it ought to have informed the company, its co-shareholder, its joint venture, joint venturer, um, it ought to have informed it of what it was proposing to do. Uh, and, and I quite see how you put that. What's pleaded? Again, noted, my lord, and... Uh, we'll start the exercise pro <laughs> probably now. Um, my Lord, uh, shall I just give you a, 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 sort of a view as to where we are? Um, yes, uh, you've been much slowed up, especially by me. Well, it's been helpful, actually, my Lord, because I, I think it may, it may allow us to accelerate matters this afternoon. Um, and as your Lordships will be aware, this, of course, very much covers the factual underpinning of the points that my learned friend, Mr Dinsmore, is going to address on the fiduciary claim. So I would hope that we're... we're Still on track. Um, I will have a look at what I've got and see how I can uh, make it efficient this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, two o'clock. Well, right, the baby. Thank you. 